welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie. Katie, how nice to see you. Hello, Ellen. I hope you're well. Why are you acting like you're the mayor? Don't let the podcast go to your head, girl. Okay, how about Katie? Simply splendid to see you, old girl. Marvelous. Absolutely spiffing. (laughs) Okay, that's enough now. I'm Ellen, the pink-haired host, and this is Katie, the boring... The what? Brown-haired host. It's a podcast. Okay, for all they know, I have the cool fucking hair. We just posted a video of ourselves on YouTube. The illusion is gone. Mm. Yeah. Video killed the radio star, that's for sure. (laughs) I'm your lion-loving snake host, Katie. And I'm the cat-loving lion host, Ellen. No, you're supposed to say that you're the snake-loving lion host. But I don't like snakes. They're scary. Unless they're behind thick-ass glass and can't get at me. Well, I don't like lions. I'm allergic to them. But I love you. Oh, you're the snake. Uh Uh-huh. In that case, I'm the snake-loving lion host, Ellen. Thank you. I'm Ellen. And I'm fucking useless this week. And you're Katie. Wait, what? I mean, you're not fucking useless. You're Katie. Uh Uh-huh. I'm the Slytherin co-host, Katie. And the Griffin horror co-host is Ellen. What did you say? I said the Gryffindor co-host is Ellen. Uh Uh-huh. I'm the Gryffindor co-host, Ellen. And the Slutterin co-host is Katie. Wait, what? You heard me, Slutterin. Gryffin whore. Love you. Love you back. I'm Extra Ellen. And I'm Crazy Katie. And together we are Extra Extra crazy. Crazy. But for now, let's just keep rolling right into our rolling rehash. Last week, we finished Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Freshly baked Dumbledore was too high to give his end-of-year speech. Hermione taught us that the first rule of time travel club is there is no time travel club. Lupin explained everything to Harry in the movie. Oh wait, he totally didn't. Ron broke federal mail tampering laws and blamed it on the twins. Seamus was all about the sloppy seconds and a giant feather was secret code, meaning greetings from your friendly escaped convict dog father. During episode 62, it was truly intense. Our Potter pondering was, we wanted to know your thoughts on who knew that Hermione had the time turner and why the ministry didn't put it together for Sirius and Buckbeak's escape. Quincy says he believes the ministry simply didn't really think a 13-year-old would be capable of pulling off such a feat. People always underestimate children. He always assumed Snape was more consumed with Lupin than Hermione, and even if he knew Hermione and Harry had something to do with it, he probably would have had a hard time proving it. Dave has two points. Number one, the Ministry believes what it wants to believe. Folks like that don't think logically, they look for confirmation bias. Number two, lots of things happen every day. They can't assume everything that happens is the result of someone with a time-turner. Carly said that all the teachers she had knew it. However, she thinks time travel, even for the most experienced wizard or witch, is confusing, and they wouldn't think that they could have done anything. Or they have the thought that Hermione isn't that bold to try something like that. It's very complicated to connect if you don't have all the pieces. She feels like that's just not where people's brains went. Which is fair. Mm Mm-hmm. Juliana thinks the only people who knew Hermione had a time-turner would be someone in that section of the Department of Mysteries, plus Hermione's teachers in Dumbledore. High-ranking ministry officials like Fudge probably had no clue Hermione had a time-turner, since the reasoning was school-related. She also imagines that the ministry never really figured out that Buckbeak helped Sirius escape. Fudge thought they were two different events. Buckbeak escaped through the forest, and Sirius used dark magic to escape like he did from Azkaban. She thinks that Hermione's teachers, including Snape, knew that she had a time-turner. They would have had to know how she was managing to get to all of her classes and doing all that homework, but agrees with Quincy. 
that Snape was so upset over the loss of the Order of Merlin that he didn't even think about the Time Turner. He might have brought it up to Dumbledore later, and the omniscient Dumbles told him the truth. Huh? Jackson says that he doubts anyone else knew that Hermione had the Time Turner. She took every precaution to ensure nobody knew, not even her two best friends. And no, the Ministry had no reason to think Hermione would use the Time Turner, because as far as Fudge was concerned, neither Harry nor Hermione had anything to do with Sirius escaping. Nicole said McGonagall wrote the letters allowing her to have one. Are you going to question that woman's judgment? Not I. Nor I. Yeah, that's a really good point. Great responses this <laughs> week, everyone. Mm -hmm. Our trivia question last week was... In the U.S. version of Prisoner of Azkaban, the trio are worried that Hagrid is going to get fired. What is the term they use in the U.K. version? This question was fairly easy, since the term was used for the movies as well. Where the American version uses fire or fired, the U.K. version and the film uses sack or sacked. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sack. <laughs> we got a good one for you to say later, so... <laughs> But congratulations goes to Mike Riley, who was the first person to answer it correctly and is now starting a new streak since this is his second week in a row. Nicely done, Mike. Let's see if you can get this question correct and bring your streak up to three. In the meantime, we're going to keep rolling into episode 63. This one doesn't focus on a chapter since we finished the third book in the movie, but instead, like we did with Sorcerers slash Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, we're going to highlight our favorite moments from the episodes covering the third story and the differences between the American and British versions of the book. Chapter 1, Owl Post. The very first difference was flashlight versus torch. When Harry was reading his school books underneath his covers, in the American version he used a flashlight, and in the UK version he was using a torch. And in the movie version he used... Illegal magic. Yes, that was definitely <laughs> a third difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our next difference was fight versus row. The battle that occurred between Harry and Bag of Assholes after Ron called and screamed into the phone was called a fight in the American version and a row in the UK version. After that phone call, Ron didn't try to call Harry again because he'd realized... He'd gotten Harry in trouble in the American version, and he'd got Harry in trouble in the British version. Which, honestly, either one works. It works, but gotten just feels right. I think that's more grammatically correct in the American English mind, but... It feels more I wouldn't correct, have been but, yeah, weirded but, out by it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and here are our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter one. He's pretty skinny. Has the glasses and the scar, and Harry finally has hairy hair. Hairy, hairy hair. Very hairy, hairy hair. <laughs> <laughs> Playing with his what? Okay, yeah, that's totally dirty. Right? And the more he waves it, the brighter it gets. I mean, paging Dr. Freud, hello. I'm just saying. <laughs> and in chapter two, Aunt Marge's big mistake, we only really had one difference. And that was, in the American version, the person on the television news station that made the announcement about the escaped convict Black was called a reporter. In the UK version, they were referred to as a newsreader. Again, I feel like we could have understood that had they left it the same. Right? I don't see the point in changing, but whatever. Neither here nor there, I guess. Is what it is. They really underestimate Americans, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> And here are our favorite moments from the episode where we covered chapter two. Because he isn't allowed to do magic outside of school. Imagine that. <laughs> isn't allowed to do magic outside of school. <laughs> what are you trying to say there, Ellen? That he isn't allowed to do magic outside of school. <laughs> Harry loses complete control of his emotions here. But seriously, if Marge would have been talking shit about my parents, like calling my dad a drunk and all that... I'd have blown her ass up, too. I love the way they did the blowing up Aunt Marge scene. It was so hilarious to see. Like, the music was just perfect. And the reactions as Aunt Marge just fucking Violet Beauregards all over the place. They were amazing. Marge is screaming. Ripper's growling. Vernon is wailing. Technically, Marge is kind of wailing, too. Wailing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, despite being a blimp, she's not having a very good year. <laughs> <laughs> we could call her the Michelin ma'am. <laughs> Chapter 3, The Night Bus. So in the American version, when we first meet Stan Shunpike, he is described to have quite a few pimples on his face. Quite a few. Quite a few. In the UK version, it's a fair few. I like fair few better. I'm, I know. I'm so... It's got the alliteration to it. and Right. Again, though, you still get the imagery of what it's trying to say. Yeah. And in the movie, they used fair few for... When Ron asked how many classes Hermione was taking, and she said a fair few. I think in a lot of ways the movies held on to the more British speaking since everyone was an actor from the UK. As well they should, yeah. <laughs> right. So, I don't It's know. still ridiculous, but... Underestimate the stupid Americans. Right. But it's still kind of fun to see the differences. <laughs> yeah, I'm not actually complaining. Yeah. It is definitely fun <laughs> to find these different... And we get to build a whole bonus episode off right? of it, so... That's exciting. <laughs> Among other things, like lamp posts and trash cans that jumped out of the way of the night bus, the U.S. version included mailboxes when the U.K. version called them letterboxes. Same damn thing. Same damn thing. <laughs> Could have figured that one out. Yep. Also among the many things, like bushes, telephone booths, and trees that get scattered by the night bus, the U.S. version said wastebaskets when the U.K. version said bollards. Which is not the same thing at all. Because a bollard, I had to look it up. I was going to say, I've never even heard of a bollard. A bollard is a sturdy post. It's often used around boats. Huh. I did not know the word bollard before I came across it doing this episode. Yeah. So I can understand why they changed it. But since it's a post, why didn't they change it to post? Like a right? wastebasket. Guardrail or thing. something. Like, yeah. Right? That's not equivalent. And then it becomes a little bit repetitive and redundant because they mention trash cans, which is the same thing as a waste basket. Yeah. So the trash cans jumped out of the way, but the waste baskets got scattered. But here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter three. Honestly, not going to lie, aside from the cystic acne, Stan Shunpike's hot. Hashtag one night Stan. <laughs> But what the fuck was up with the shrunken head? Like, that made zero sense. Sounding like Miss Cleo up in this bitch. Like, what the hell? Seriously. They gave it a Jamaican accent. When the practice of head shrinking has only been documented in the northwestern region of the Amazon forest. It makes no sense whatsoever. That's what you took away from that? <laughs> yes, it is. It's just, like, completely inaccurate. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 4, The Leaky Cauldron. After Scabbers shot out of the shop witch's hands like a bar of soap, he scampered out the door in the U.S. version and scarpered out the door in the U.K. version. Scarpered? Sure. I mean, I'm sure, given context, anyone could have figured out what that meant, but I am a little bit glad that they changed it to scampered. <laughs> yeah, scarpered is not a word that we use here. No, not at all. But it means the same thing. Yeah. After Scabbers escapes, Ron goes racing after him in the American version, but herring after him in the British version. Hmm. It's interesting that they changed it here because they use herring in the U.S. version later, describing Malfoy going herring after Harry when he pretended to see the snitch. Herring after Harry is <laughs> hella fun to say. Right? Give it a shot. Herring after Harry. I like that. Yeah. But they use it later on, so I'm not sure why they felt the need to change it here. Well, because now we have alliteration. Yes, that's true. That's why. Herring after Scabbers isn't all that interesting. Herring after Harry is, so. Fair enough. Yeah. Also in the American version, Harry overheard Mr. and Mrs. Weasley arguing about whether or not Arthur should tell Harry that Black is after him. In the UK version, he overheard the rowing. And same thing as fight and row. Yeah. From earlier, too, just adding the INGs. Now, the first time I ever saw the word row, I read it as row. Mm hmm. So I can see the changing there. It could get a little confusing. Yeah. I mean, if you utilize context clues at all, it should be pretty <laughs> clear what it means. But, right. Kids' books. Exactly. Yeah. And now, here are some of our favorite moments from the episode where we talked about chapter four 
Yeah, I can just imagine him saying to himself, Self, you have a good broom. It's never failed to lose you a Quidditch match. You don't need this. But maybe someone on the Gryffindor team would want it. Like, I could buy the Firebolt and give them my Nimbus. But it says price on request. You have no idea how much it costs. Like, sure, your parents left you a lot of money, but you still have five years of Hogwarts left. Do you really want to ask the Dursleys to help buy your spell books? Okay, fine, I won't buy it. But I'm still going to visit it every day and stare at it longingly. God, it's like Harry's brain is that tree and you're those little cookie elves. <laughs> Ron wonders if they would get a reward for catching him, and Mr. Weasley tells him not to be ridiculous that Black isn't going to be caught by a 13-year-old wizard. Well, that comment doesn't age well. <laughs> right? He walks Harry away from everyone as he tells him, and meanwhile, the wanted posters in the background with Gary Oldman just going fucking guano-style crazy, because he's crazy Gary Oldman. <laughs> crazy Gary Oldman. <laughs> Chapter 5 the Dementor. So this one has line versus Q. Uh -huh. And when the Weasleys and Harry and Hermione are heading to King's Cross Station in the Ministry of Magic Cars, they're able to just jump to the front of the line of the unmoving traffic in the American version. But it's the Q in the UK version. I, embarrassingly enough didn't know what a Q was until a, so much later in life than I should have. It wasn't until Netflix came out, like Netflix when they sent you the DVDs and you made right. a Q. And I was like, the hell is a Q? I think like you've it, told that story before because then we had to go and follow it up with a joke about how it's literally the letter Q followed by a bunch of silent letters in a Q in a line. behind it. Yes, <laughs> in a line. So we're just going to make that I joke was... again. For your listening pleasure. <laughs> Hope you liked it. It's always fun. <laughs> Instead of a change of grammar, this is a slight character switch. The US version has Harry and Ron lead the way to the end of the train, but the UK version says that Harry and Mr. Weasley led the way. So, what the hell, guys? There are some things that I think might just be typos. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you read the description in the book, it makes it sound like... They walk down the outside of the train and then load their stuff and step back out and like that all of the doors to the train cars are on the outside. Mm -hmm. But if you watch the movie, they walk down a corridor on the inside. Yeah. So it wouldn't make any sense for Mr. Weasley to be the one walking down to the end of the train if they're inside the train. So maybe they decided to switch it. I checked in the UK version that I just got from the shops in Scotland. What, like a year ago now? Mm-hmm. And it definitely says Harry and Mr. Weasley. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, think about, you know, it's not the first time they've switched characters. Yeah. On There's a couple too. more in this, too. Yep. But once on the train, Hermione lets Crookshanks out of his little basket. And he immediately starts to go after Scabbers again. And Ron yells, get out of here in the American version and get out of it in the UK version. I like get out of it, but only when it's in a British accent. So there's that. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but... It doesn't change the meaning of it. No, not at like, all. It makes perfect sense. It seems unnecessary. Yeah. The description of Goyle's arms are said to be gorilla-ish arms in the US version versus just gorilla arms in the UK version, which... I mean, maybe they were afraid us stupid Americans were going to picture Goyle with hairy gorilla arms. Like they were transplanted from a gorilla magically onto Goyle <laughs> because magic and we're stupid. <laughs> so once they make it to school, Harry and Hermione get pulled aside by Professor McGonagall. And after she has a chat with Harry about passing out on the train, she asks him to wait outside her office while she has a discussion with Hermione about her course schedule in the American version and her timetable in the UK version, which we've come across that one before. Mm hmm Yeah. Which, I mean, again, context clues and everything, you can figure it out, but... Teach us new words, yo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had never, I think before this, necessarily heard it referred to as a timetable. So 
people would probably end up thinking are multiplication. Well, those are times tables because it's six times six and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they learn that Hagrid is the new care of magical creatures teacher, Ron says they should have known because who else would have assigned us a biting book in the U.S. version and who else would have set us a biting book in the U.K. version? Again, context. I mean... Right. That's not a tough one. Yeah. Here's our favorite moments from the episodes covering Chapter 5. Mr. Weasley asks Harry to promise that whatever he might hear, he won't go looking for Black, and Harry asks the same question. Why would I go looking for someone who wants to kill me? Because, I don't know, you've literally done it every other year so far, dumbass. Like, damn. (laughs) RJ sounds so posh and, like, unlooping-like. RJ, old chap. RJ, my good man. Top joy, RJ, old bean. (laughs) It really does. Because now I'm hearing it in Prince John's voice. From Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. EJ. (laughs) Except it's RJ. I like that. Do you know that I do? (laughs) Put it on my luggage. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, RJ. Hmm. RJ. (laughs) And in the book, it was basically Harry's top priority. Number one, get to Hogsmeade. Number two, buy a firebolt. Number three, metal. Number four, hang out with Ron and Hermione. Number five, don't get killed. (laughs) Hermione would be really upset that don't get expelled isn't anywhere on that list. (laughs) Ron's would probably have get to Honeydukes on there at least twice. His would be number one, overshadow his brothers. Then two through five, get to Honeydukes. <laughs> <laughs> Hermione's would probably be number one, don't get expelled. Then two through five, go to the library. <laughs> she needs to sort out her priorities. <laughs> Throwback. <laughs> Welcome back to Hogwarts. I'll be your new Dumbledore this year, and I may or may not have started growing gillyweed in my office. But don't worry, it's for my glaucoma. (laughs) Well, seriously, though, I mean, how fucking pissed must Snape have been? You're giving the position that I want to someone I've literally hated most of my life, and you sit me right next to him at dinner? Like, what the fuck, hippie Dumbledore? (laughs) Hippie Dumbledore. (laughs) So basically, do not give the Dementors any reason to harm you, And for God's sakes, if they want your chicken fingers, you give them your chicken fingers. Not the chicken fingers. Do you want to lose your soul? Because that's how you lose your soul. Fine. Bye-bye, chicken fingers. You are so delicious. (laughs) (laughs) Why the hell is Neville wearing a sweater vest, or as we've discussed in the past, a tank top, and suspenders over his pajamas? Maybe they were playing some weird opposite of strip poker game where they have to put clothes on to make themselves look stupid (laughs) maybe i mean seamus was wearing a red robe and had a tie around his head ron was wearing a knit hat and it looks like dean has a scarf tied around his head harry's the only one that looks relatively normal until he eats something that causes steam to come out of his ears yeah i mean That's the weirdest game I've ever heard of, but maybe. (laughs) What would it be called? Because opposite of strip poker doesn't really work. (laughs) Opposite. Want to play opposite of strip poker? What? Um, (laughs) It's a mouthful. Reverse strip poker? Clothing? I don't know. Poker? Anyway. I don't know. Anyway. Chapter six. Talons and tea leaves. George reacts to Malfoy mocking Harry about fainting because of the Dementors by calling him a little git and saying that he wasn't so cocky last night when the Dementors were down at our end of the train in the U.S. version and down our end of the train in the U.K. version. So we just took out Nat. Yeah, they actually will see that quite a lot. Yeah. A lot of words get dropped. Those are the biggest differences I've noticed this time. I think there were a lot more vocabulary changes Mm -hmm. in the previous two books, but now they're like slipping in the British words a little bit more. They're like, yeah, we'll let this one get by. Yeah. (laughs) But they're they're still like adjusting some of the phrasing. Mm -hmm. In divination class, when Harry looks into Ron's teacup, he sees a crooked sort of cross in the U.S. version and a wonky sort of cross in the U.K. version. 
I love wonky. I love <laughs> wonky. I can't hear that word without thinking about the wonky donkey. But. <laughs> okay. Have you not heard that story? I don't think so. Oh my gosh. After this, I'm totally showing it to you. And then for everybody else, I'm posting it because it has nothing to do with Harry Potter, but it's hilarious. Okay. After this, Ron tells him, you need your inner eye tested in the American version and you need your inner eye testing in the UK version. My brain doesn't like that one. Yeah, I was. I'm okay with that change. The only thing I can think is that maybe I kind of see it a bit more as like, you need your inner eye testing done. They drop out words and imply things, I think. Yeah. This one is one of my favorites. Hermione thinks the Grimm isn't an omen, rather a cause of death, because people die of fright. And Harry hasn't died because he's not stupid enough to see one and think, right, well, I'd better kick the bucket then. Except that's the American version. In the UK version, she says, I'd better pop my clogs then. (laughs) And I got the stupidest grin on my face because... Pop my clogs is just so fun to pop say. Pop my clogs. I want to use that from now on. I'd better pop my clogs then. Better pop my clogs. We actually asked Max about that one and he was like, yeah, it's a saying, but not one that kids say. <laughs> I mean, I was almost like, well, that makes no sense. But then thinking about it, I'm like, well, kick the bucket doesn't really makes sense either if you just take it as the words themselves i suppose so yeah okay no neither of them do no they're both they're both a little weird for all we know somebody british could read the american version and be like kick the bucket that's amazing right (laughs) (laughs) exactly when ron and hermione are arguing about the grim he reminds her that professor trelawney said that she didn't have the right aura and says You just don't like being bad at something for a change, in the American version. In the UK version, he says, you just don't like being rubbish at something for a change. And I gotta say, rubbish comes across way more harsh than bad. It really does. It does. Rubbish. You are literal garbage at this, Hermione. You suck. (laughs) You stink. Literally. Mm -hmm. Another one was binder clips versus bowl clips. Some people had their monster book of monsters clamped together with them. So binder clips in the American version, bowl clips in the British version. And from what I can tell, they're literally the same things. They just have a different name. That's got to be some big ass binder clips, though, to keep a whole book closed. I don't think the monster book of monsters was as thick in the book as it was portrayed in the movie. I think if they're describing it as something that could be clamped with binder clips, which I mean, you can get those in two inches. True. I don't know. I just, I always imagine like a little bitty binder clip. So it just seems odd to me, but. Yeah, they make them pretty big. After Buckbeak attacked Draco, in the American version, Pansy thinks that they should fire Hagrid straight away. And the UK version has her say that they should sack him straight away. Hermione is worried that they will fire him or sack him as well. And this was also our trivia question. It was. Which was kind of a gimme because the movie uses that term. Yeah. We don't want to make it too tough when it's the vocabulary changes. Right. That if you don't have access to the UK versions of the book, how do you know? Mm-hmm. Well, like for the last one, remember, we used sweater vest and and tank top. Yeah. Were the two different ones. And that, like, nobody got it for so long. But we checked to make sure it was Googleable. Mm-hmm. We just had a lot of other guesses first. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one was much more difficult because literally... It was definitely in, much more difficult. So. In that case, like, literally both of those articles of clothing are totally different things. Yeah, they just kind of flip-flopped them. Yeah, exactly. And then the last one for this chapter is while trying to cheer up Hagrid about Buckbeak's attack on Malfoy, Harry tells him that it's Malfoy's problem that he wasn't listening in the U.S. version. And it's Malfoy's problem he wasn't listening in the UK version. So it just drops the that. It's another one of the drop in the words. Mm -hmm. But that actually gave blue squiggly lines on the Google Doc. I'm seeing this. Yeah. So I think that's just an American English grammar thing. 
They both sound fine. Actually, adding that sounds too extra. Well, and and there are some instances where you need to add a that after that in order to make it grammatically correct. Yeah. You literally have to be like, he said that that is. Yeah. And like, say them differently. And in a lot of ways, our addition of that is very extra, especially when it makes you double it up like that. Well, yeah. So I think if we could teach ourselves to speak without that extra that it probably isn't very necessary it's just kind of ingrained in us we just like putting different emphasis on different syllables so we also like extra words apparently we do we cheat it at scrabble (laughs) (laughs) and now here are some of our favorite moments from the episodes that covered chapter six the whomping willow tree is just swaying its branches after murdering a bird Birdering. It's a birderer. <laughs> no, just, yeah, no. no. <laughs> you sit there and you just be quiet now. In the movie, some random boy reads the description from a book and, seriously though, what is it with the random students who keep popping up? Like, it drives me nuts every time I watch this movie. I wouldn't have nearly the issue with it that I do if they would have used someone who's actually in the book, given him a name or something. Like, they should have made it Dean fucking Thomas! That could have been Dean Thomas's line. Or Pravati! I, I don't know, I'm legitimately just mad the kid doesn't have a name. Yeah, the kid is literally credited as Boy One. That's bullshit, I'm just saying. Then she nearly outs Trelawney as a fraud, but cuts herself off to tell Harry he looks in excellent health and she won't be letting him out of the homework that day. But if he does die, he need not turn it in. I love it! I love it! I love her so much! I know! Oh, McGonagall, you sassy, sassy bitch. Oh, I wish it had been in the movie so Mm -hmm. much. (laughs) Then Ron wonders exactly how many classes she's taking. All of them, motherfucker! All of them! (laughs) Imagine a conversation between Arthur and Molly all about it. (laughs) He said, I'm assuming it was for something mundane and work related. My question is, what was that conversation with Molly like? Molly, my love, I'm off to Azkaban tomorrow. Oh, oh, really, Arthur? I told you mucking about with those muggle artifacts would get you pinched one of these days. What? Exactly. What will we tell the children? Molly, no, I'm going for work. I'll be back for dinner. And Fred and George, you know they'll wind up in a cell right next to yours when they try to bust their criminal father out. Which, let's be honest, that's exactly what Fred and George would do. (laughs) Right? For sure. Let it never go unsaid that Goyle long-bottomed well before Neville did. It shall not, as you just said it. (laughs) Just saying. But I think that creates a paradox. If Goyle did it first, can it still be called long-bottoming? I'm gonna go with yes, because Goyling does not sound good at all. Like, that sounds like an infection of some kind. <laughs> like, that sounds like what the doctor does when he has to pop a pimple. Like, I'm just gonna Goyle this real quick. Like, <laughs> it, just, it just sounds really gross. So I'm gonna stick with long-bottoming. <laughs> that is a very gross and good point. <laughs> expecting that one were you we can definitely keep long bottoming <laughs> hagrid returns with the half horse half eagle looking creatures horsey bird yay horsey bird i like the horsey birds totally the title by the way <laughs> poor neville though why is it always him i feel like this time it isn't quite his fault forget the dog ate my homework in care of magical creatures class your homework eats the dog <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and it could be the book or it could be one of the creatures. You don't know. Right? You don't, you know, don't know, man. Chapter 7, The Boggart in the Wardrobe. There's actually nothing really new in this chapter. <laughs> There's another instance of fired versus sacked, again in relation to Malfoy trying to get Hagrid in trouble for the hippogriff situation. Plus normal things like favored having a U in it for the British version. F-A-V-O-U-R-E-D. We drop that U. So we're all about the extra words, but fuck those extra letters. Right? (laughs) But here are our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter seven. 
It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare it's hands. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. <laughs> what? First off, you can't even. Is it easier to catch smoke with gloved hands? Like, is that easier somehow? Does having bare hands make it more difficult? I don't know how having bare hands would be better for anything. I mean, I feel like the claws would get in the way. Oh, that was so <laughs> bad. That was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but her boggart does not become a mummy. It becomes a giant ass nope rope. And then when she says ridiculous, it turns into an equally giant ass clown jack in the box. Like cobra to clown? How is that less scary, Pravati? You're not helping. It's not. It's really, really not. But it's at this point of the movie that Harry is next in line. Because, you know, let's have a class where everyone will get to see Harry terrifying childhood Potter's worst fear come to life in front of them. Great idea, Lupin. This couldn't possibly go wrong in any way. You win at teaching. Lucky for him, the bar is low. Like, really low. <laughs> Chapter 8. Flight of the Fat Lady During a fanatical Oliver Wood speech that the movie deprived us of, he shares that Gryffindor hasn't won for seven years now. The UK version says that Gryffindor haven't won for seven years now. Which, honestly, I think both ways work. Mm -hmm. You could think of it as the Gryffindor team hasn't won. Yeah. It would be appropriate because team is singular. But if you think of Gryffindor as a collective, like replacing it with they then haven't won would be appropriate. Yeah, it could go either way. I've heard it both ways. And while all of her wood is talking up the skill on the team, he adds himself as an afterthought in the twins compliment him. In the US version, Fred calls him a spanking good keeper. And in the UK version, it's cracking good. Okay, as an American, I've never said spanking good. <laughs> no, no, I can understand switching it from cracking good. Uh, but I can't understand switching. I mean, okay. <laughs> I would have gathered what cracking good meant just fine. Yeah. Context clues. Teach us new words. Yes. But I can still understand switching it. It's not a phrase we use. We don't say cracking good. However. No. We don't say spanking good either. <laughs> we don't. We say like brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. But not spanking good. I'm not sure like, what that means either though. Brands now I'm questioning that phrase. Spanking good. <laughs> It's so good you just want to spank it. Spanks. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> Let's just keep rolling. Later on, when Harry asks Professor Lupin about preventing him from facing the Boggart, Lupin tells Harry that he assumed the Boggart would take on the shape of Lord Voldemort. In the American version, Harry just flat out denies thinking of Voldemort. However, in the UK version, he admits that he did think of Voldemort at first, but then remembered those Dementors. It's interesting that they changed that, because if I'm remembering correctly, he did actually think of Voldemort. Yeah. Back at full power, that was the first thing that came to his mind. Yeah. And then he remembered the Dementors. Yeah. So it seems strange. Like, we're going to just streamline this sentence out. Yeah. In the American version. Randomly. And in the movie, too, he said, I did think of Voldemort at first, but then I thought of that night on the train with the Dementor. So. Yeah. Like I said, I think they keep the movies... A little bit closer to the British phrasing. Oh, yeah. But this seems like not necessarily British phrasing, though. This is a difference in Harry's thought process. So he thinks more Britishly. That's... <laughs> All right. I'll give that to you. I don't know. <laughs> I, like I said, we Americans drop extra words. <laughs> and then the last one for this chapter. Is after the Halloween feast, when there's a holdup at the Gryffindor portrait hall entrance... Percy said for someone to get Professor Dumbledore, and a moment later, Professor Dumbledore was there, in the American version. In the UK version, it said, next moment, Professor Dumbledore was there. I mean, they both make sense to me, so... They both make perfect sense to me. Yeah. We don't... I mean, it's not a common phrase. We do say, in a moment, or a moment later, more than we would say next moment. Yeah. But... I was thinking, like, next thing you know... Right? Next thing you know, Professor Dumbledore was there. Like... Bam! He appeared. Bam! Magic! magic. <laughs> and here are our favorite moments from our episode covering chapter eight. Do you think the staff were secretly happy that Harry never got his worm signed? 
Like, okay, so how are we going to keep Potter safe during a very loosely chaperoned field trip to a very public place? What's that? He didn't get his form signed. Oh, thank Merlin. I don't get paid nearly enough to babysit that moody little death magnet. <laughs> moody little death magnet. <laughs> That's what he is. What do you think this is? Book five? <laughs> oh, just wait. <laughs> So I don't buy it in the slightest that Movie Lupin still thought the Boggart was going to turn into Voldemort. Right? It's kind of like he goes, you want to know why I stopped you from facing that Boggart? And Harry's just going, except for the part where you kind of didn't. <laughs> like, Right. Except for that whole thing. But he tells Filch to round up the ghost so they can search the other portraits for the fat lady. And Filch tells him there is no need and points her out. Dude must have killed a I spy. Just saying. Right? Where's Waldo Master? Dumbledore is able to directly ask her who did this to her. And what the hell is the fat lady wearing on her damn head? Is that a whole grapevine wound around her hat? I mean, yeah, basically. Maybe she thought it would help her blend into her surroundings. I guess. But the fat lady very dramatically tells Dumbledore, Eyes like the devil he's got, and a soul as black as his name. It's him, Headmaster. The one they all talk about. He's here, somewhere in the castle. Serious Black! <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. I practice my fat lady talk. Chapter 9. Grim Defeat. Again, there's no real notable differences here, unless you want to count the fact that the American version spells Halloween as just one word, and the British version has an apostrophe between the double E's because it's Hallow's Eve, a Halloween. Mm -hmm. It combined two words to become Halloween. And for us, it's just Halloween. I prefer that. It just makes it feel better. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> and here's our favorite moments from the episode covering Chapter 9. So Madam Hooch now has to oversee the training sessions. They all but eliminated Quidditch from this film, so there was really no need to include this detail. Though it would have been fun to see some more Madam Hooch. Cause, you know, Hooch is crazy. Hooch is crazy. Crazy Madam Hooch! No, still doesn't work. Just crazy Gary Oldman. That's so much better. It was worth a shot. Yeah, I guess. And it does that thing again where all the students are already in class, but their teacher isn't in the room. So Snape can just billow into the classroom like, all right, you little fuck, sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up. But I actually just want to think that Snape was secretly super stoked to sub for Lupin. Like, maybe he stayed up late trying to choose the right robes to wear. Like, well, I do like these obsidian black robes, but I'm not sure they're billowy enough. Maybe I'll just go with the midnight black ones. Ooh, or the ink black ones. They bring out my eyes. Decisions, decisions. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just owl ordered a new set of ebony roads that are perfect for flouncing. I wish those had arrived already. I should have signed up for Almazon Prime. Almazon Prime? Is that what I... really? Yeah, it's that delivery service that was started by Jeff Bezor. His love note that shows a drawing of stick figure Draco throwing a ball at Harry's head right before he gets struck by lightning. And in that sense, it's really the only way it could remotely be considered a good burn. <laughs> <laughs> Point Ellen. Chapter 10. The Marauder's Map. When the twins give Harry the Marauder's Map because they decided his need was greater than theirs, George says, anyway, we know it by heart, in the U.S. version. In the UK version, George says, anyway, we know it off by heart. So here's an instance where we weren't the ones with the extra word. Yeah, right? I've never heard it phrased that way before. We know it off by heart. Prior to reading Harry Potter and then like fan fiction and more British literature, I didn't, I hadn't either. But now it doesn't phase me necessarily. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. And now here are some of our favorite moments from our episode covering chapter 10. It just goes right into Harry asking Lupin why the Dementors affect him so much. He does ask that in the book, too. I'll tell you why. Because you're fucked up, kid. That's why. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the movie has Harry, a.k.a. Captain Obvious, say, It's a map of Hogwarts. 
No, Harry, it's a map of the fucking Cheesecake Factory, you ninny. <laughs> There's also a random-ass chimney sweep walking past. Like, when the fuck did this become a Dickens novel? No idea. Chapter 11, The Firebolt. During the Christmas dinner, Dumbledore gets really excited about crackers and offers the end of a large silver noisemaker to Snape in the U.S. version. And simply a large silver one in the UK version, which kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Specifying that it was a noisemaker helped a lot because when I first read this book, I didn't actually know what crackers were. And I legit just imagined a plate of Brits or maybe the nice buttery club crackers. Yeah. Or maybe the nice buttery club crackers. I vaguely knew what crackers were but not necessarily so yeah it, it's definitely better to dumb this one down for the americans i guess <laughs> even then i don't think i immediately processed that the noisemaker and the cracker was the same thing yeah but now i have to say crackers are my favorite part of christmas now i love doing crackers at christmas i was so bummed last year target had so many different harry potter themed crackers most of yeah. them had harry potter socks in them Mm -hmm. And I didn't end up buying any. And so I was like, so going to do that for us this year. And then they didn't have any. Bullshit. Yeah. That sucks. Super sucks. Once settled into his cracker hat, Dumbledore advises everyone to dig in for the American version and to tuck in for the British version. Which tuck in confused me at first. Yeah. Because Molly says it in Chamber of Secrets when she's giving all the kids breakfast. And she says, there you go, Harry, tuck in. And I was like, tuck in, T like, because I always think like tuck in for bed or something, right. like tuck in the covers. So I kind of get that one. But like we say, teach us new words. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. After the Christmas dinner, Harry and Ron get up from the table still wearing their party hats in the U.S. version and their cracker hats in the U.K. version. <laughs> yeah. I would have been very confused by cracker hats. I'm totally imagining, like, a hat made of club crackers at this point, which... I'm just trying to imagine what the whitest hat would look like. What would a white person hat look like? Oh. Is it a cowboy hat? Is that a cracker hat? <laughs> I'm like, where are you going with this white person hat? Yeah, probably. Probably a cowboy hat. But here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 11. Promise me you won't go looking for black. Right? Why would I go looking for a nutter who wants to kill me? Because you got a history of doing it, bro. That's why. Because we've met you. It's your fourth greatest talent. Mm-hmm. Facts. This is also the third time this chapter that Harry has dropped a Voldemort and it's barely started. But maybe Ron just doesn't like when people say Voldemort because he finds the silent T at the end to be pretentious as fuck. I feel personally attacked. I mean, shoe fits. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my god, Dumbledore's reaction to crackers is pretty much exactly me. Like, they might be my favorite thing at Christmas. And the vulture hat coming out of Snape's cracker has to be one of the best moments. Especially since Snape already seemed super unhappy to take part in such a silly Christmas tradition in the first place. Right, and I especially love that Dumbledore just immediately puts it on when Snape pushes it towards him. <laughs> He's like, get this thing away from me, and Dumbledore's just like, my hat. <laughs> Sorry the way you said that. <laughs> My hat. Trelawney says, Certainly I knew Minerva, but one does not parade the fact that one is all-knowing. I frequently act as though I'm not possessed of the inner eye, so as not to make others nervous. And McGonagall simply says, That explains a great deal. Oof. Trelawney might want to get some ice for her inner black eye after that one. Damn. <laughs> Youch. Chapter 12, The Patronus After Hermione got Harry's firebolt confiscated, Harry is able to acknowledge that she meant well, but that's not enough to stop him from being angry with her in the American version. In the UK version, it drops the from and just says that didn't stop him being angry with her. I mean, they both make sense. Yeah. I can understand it both ways, so I didn't, I don't really have an issue there. <laughs> Now here are some of our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 12. 
It's definitely shorter than our episodes have been lately, but we still managed to get a solid 43 minutes out of it. Well, we are really good at talking. Yay bullshitting! Yay indeed. And then the scene cuts to Lupin and Harry for the lesson. I don't think it's the history of Magic Classroom, like the book says. I guess it's just the Defense Against the Dark Arts room? But like, what the fuck is with all the rando spine candles? Is Lupin moonlighting? Pun intended. (laughs) As a chiropractor or something? (laughs) The moonlighting chiropractor. (laughs) It's clearly gotta be his day job, it can't be his night job. Obviously. Obviously. The lamps flicker and the Dementor steps from the box and moves silently towards Harry, drawing a deep, rattling breath. Because Dementors can't fucking fly. Except in the movie, because the Dementors can fucking fly. And the Dementor glides up and hovers in the air, looming towards Harry, because it's fucking flying. Did I mention it's flying? Because it's flying. It's fucking flying. Is the Dementor flying? Dementor's fucking flying. That's not okay. Just not. He also asks Harry what memory he was thinking of, and this is when Harry tells him that it was the first time he rode a broom. Lupin says that's not nearly good enough. Well, sorry my childhood wasn't happy enough for you, Lupin. In case you hadn't heard, my parents were ganked when I was an infant, and I was raised by people who put the vile in revilement. Forgive me if Pickens are slim in the happy memory orchard. (laughs) Happy memory orchard. (laughs) Harry flat out refuses to buy anything that Malfoy thinks is good, and instead of ordering a new broom, he just continually asks McGonagall if he can have the firebolt back. Well, I mean, he has a perfectly good broom once she's done checking it for Jinxes. Why would he want to buy another one? I don't know. I kind of understand. I know. I totally her. do, too. Like, I just, but it just makes me think of, like, you know, like the... Are you done yet? Yeah. Are you, are you done, done yet? yet? Are, are you, you done, done yet? yet? Are, are you, you done, done yet? yet? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I love it. By the twelfth time, she finally tells him to stop badgering her. She will let him know when they are done yet. (laughs) But Harry finishes his butterbeer and heads back to his common room, running into Professor McGonagall along the way. She has been looking for him to finally return the firebolt, because she's done now. She done now? She done now. She done now. I just want the image of her poking Harry with the firebolt going, I'm done done now. now. I'm I'm done done now. now. I'm done now. (laughs) Chapter 13. Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. So after Harry finally gets the firebolt back and the Gryffindors go to practice, which is spelled with a C in the American version and an S in the British version. It looks so weird with an S. It Sorry. does, doesn't it? <laughs> so strange. I bet you they think it looks weird with a C. I Probably. <laughs> but Madame Hooch holds them up admiring the broom herself. Well, you know, Hooch is crazy. Hooch is crazy. <laughs> But Oliver Wood has to ask if it's okay if Harry gets it back. In the American version, he says, we need to practice. In the UK version, he says, only we need to practice. So I asked Max about the added on only, and he said it's just a colloquialism. They use it at the start of explanations, but it doesn't have any purpose. He gave the example of, can I leave the table? Only I haven't had a wee since breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's confusing to us since we think of only as meaning solely or exclusively. Or at the very least, or the final outcome. Yeah. It actually has quite a few meanings, and none of them are words that we would put at the beginning. Yeah. Like, it sounds like an excuse. I was was just thinking that. It sounds like, I I wouldn't need to do this, only... only... (laughs) I didn't sleep at all last night. Yes. Exactly. I started working on the episode stuff, only I had a headache. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I love you so much for giving me this one, Ellen. It should also show you how much I love you. You know what? It really does, actually. (laughs) There is no better sign of your love for me than... (laughs) Because this is our favorite one. I was going to say this is my favorite one, but let's be honest, this is our favorite one. When Oliver Wood asks Harry if he sorted out his Dementor problem, Fred confidently tells him that the Dementors won't turn up again. Dumbledore go ballistic. That's not my favorite part. That's just the American version. <laughs> the UK version says that Dumbledore do his nut. <laughs> <laughs> and this is hilarious to us because we're 13 years old. It is. I'm, I 
don't care how old I ever get. That will be funny to me until the day I die. Do I am his sorry. nut. We actually did ask Max about this one as well. Thank God for Max. Right? I got to tell you. <laughs> and he said that it is a saying, but again, it's not one that kids really use. Yeah. But I mean, this is said by Fred, so... I don't think that the phrasing of do his nut is actually in any way, shape, or form inappropriate. <laughs> I think that's our brains. Our 13-year-old American boy brains. <laughs> <laughs> that find that to be something to giggle at. I'm sorry. I, I don't think it has hilarious. the same meaning. I'm sure if you grew up with the phrase, it's got to be totally different. So I understand. Yeah. But we didn't grow up with the phrase. We didn't. <laughs> Do his nut. Like. <laughs> I don't. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to say I don't think that phrasing means the same. I don't think it has the same connotation that it does to us. Well, I think it's like an old person saying. I think that's what Max was trying to say. It's like an old fashioned saying, like kick the bucket. Okay. Pop my clogs. It's not pop my clogs. It's not kid slang is what I was trying to get at. I'm going to do my nut and pop my clogs <laughs> or do my nut till I pop my clogs. In other words, you would go ballistic until you kicked the bucket. Yes. See? Exactly. <laughs> Here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 13. Yeah, despite his nerves, he can't help but notice just how pretty she is. He sees her and goes, Cho Chang! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Wow. Ron takes that moment to loudly make a comment about Scabbers just being eaten, and Hermione bursts into tears and heads up to her dorm. Yeah, that version of Hermione is nowhere near the movie. Right? She's all cheek and no bleak. <laughs> Do you like that? That's... I like it, but I don't want to. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's probably going to be the title. <laughs> She's all cheek and no bleak. Also, what the fuck, Sir Cadagan? Like, I'm pretty sure, password or not, you should have known better than to let crazy Gary Oldman into the Gryffindor common room. Seriously. And yes, I spelled that like serious black. Fuck, are you kidding me right now? Nope. Chapter 14. Snape's Grudge. When Ron, sorry, when Ron woke up and saw Sirius Black standing over his bed, he yelled and Black scampered, or scarpered, in the UK version. In the US version, he later asks Harry, why did he run? And the UK version, again, uses scarper. Which, scarper is a very weird word. Yeah, the more I hear it, the more I'm just like, scarper. Yeah, scarper. 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 It's just starting to sound like a noise to me now. <laughs> Scarper. Scarper. Like, it's one of those words that I just feel like I'm mispronouncing every time I say it, despite the fact I know I'm not. I don't know of any other way you could possibly pronounce that word. Because you know, know it's not scarper. Scarper. It's not scarper. 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 Scoop. Scrapper. No, nah, I got nothing. Moving on. In the U.S. version, when Snape is making comparisons between Harry and Harry's father, James, Harry's response is, my dad didn't strut, and neither do I. In the U.K. version, it has him say, and nor do I. Which is also how he says it in the movie. My dad didn't strut, and nor do I. Which I love. I'm sorry. He says struttily. He said struttily. <laughs> But I love, I, I so prefer nor over neither. I don't know why. Just makes me happier, I guess. <laughs> it sounds more posh. It does. And here are some of our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 14. I love that in the first story, a troll gets in and everyone panics and has to go back to their common rooms for safety. But in this story, it's perfectly safe to hire trolls to hang out right around all the kids. Well, I mean, obviously, the troll from the first year was a wild troll, and these are, like, professional trolls. Domesticated trolls. Yes, they're domestic trolls. <laughs> They've been trained properly. <laughs> sure, let's go with that. Yeah. Hagrid is wearing the very hairy brown suit and that terrible tie that was described in the book. Hagrid's tie looks like it was made out of felt. Right? Seriously. It's pretty awful. Is Hagrid's suit what Bigfoot cuts off after No Shave November, maybe? Yes. <laughs> That's totally where Hagrid got his suit. 
woven from Bigfoot hair. That's what it looks like. And Hermione definitely didn't help Hagrid with the defense in the movie, or he would have come up with better than, he's a good hippogriff, always cleans his feathers. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly why they shouldn't kill him. Keeps his feathers clean. Right? My understanding is that Jeffrey Dahmer bathed as well, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> At this point in both the book and the movie, Snape tells Harry that he's extraordinarily like his father. In the book, he calls them both arrogant, and in both, he specifically uses the term strut. My dad didn't strut, and nor do I, Harry responds struttily. He tells Harry to open it and points his wand at it, saying, Reveal your secrets. Writing begins to appear on the map, and Snape demands that he read it out to him. Harry reads, Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs offer their compliments to Professor Snape and request that he keep his abnormally large nose out of other people's business. Dude, Snape got owned by a spare bit of parchment. Chapter 15, The Quidditch Final. After Hermione slaps Malvoy, she tells Harry that he'd better beat him in the Quidditch Final because she can't stand it if Slytherin wins, in the American version, or Slytherin win in the UK version. This one again goes with whether or not you consider Slytherin to be singular or plural. Yeah. For some reason, this one feels, wins feels more proper, I guess. But Because she can't stand it if Slytherin win. Yeah, I like the S better. Yeah. But we're American, so that kind of makes sense. Yeah. When the Gryffindor team enters the Great Hall before the Quidditch final... They are greeted with enormous applause. The U.S. version says that both the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff table were applauding them too. And the U.K. version says that they were clapping them too. Which, I mean, it, you're, it's the same thing, but we don't really call applauding clapping. We do, like, I mean, we can say clap your hands, but whenever we say clapping, it involves actively, like, that's the verb? Yeah. Like, if you are, if you are clapping... You have two things that you're clapping together, like your hands or two erasers. Yeah. We don't really say like, we don't really say that you clap at people. You clap for people. Yeah, exactly. So like the phrasing is just strange for us. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously, again, context clues. We right. would have. Had they said they were clapping for them too, it wouldn't have sounded strange at all. Yeah. That would have made perfect sense, actually. Yeah. But to just say. Clapping them is very, feels, it's weird to it us. feels very odd, but yeah, that's yeah. us. <laughs> In the actual match, after Marcus Flint smashed into Angelina Johnson, Fred retaliated by throwing his beater's club at the back of Flint's head. The American version says, a moment later, Fred Weasley chucked his beater's club, and the UK version says, next moment, Fred Weasley had chucked his beater's club. So this one does that a moment later mm -hmm. versus next moment. As well as adding in the had. It was just Fred Weasley chucked versus Fred Weasley had chucked. Yeah. Which, I mean. You do you, boo. Right? That's. <laughs> okay. I, there's, there's nothing else to say about that if I'm being I honest. I read that sentence and understood it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> and then crazy Madam Hooch. Nah, still doesn't work that way. <laughs> which is weird because Hooch is crazy. Hooch is crazy. <laughs> anyway, she awards a penalty shot to Gryffindor and Slytherin in the American version and drops two for the UK version, just saying penalty shot Gryffindor and penalty shot Slytherin. Again, just dropping those extra words. Yep. During the match, Harry pretended to see the snitch to lead Malfoy away from the actual snitch. This is also where they use the word herring in both, despite having switched it out earlier. Mm -hmm. But there is also a change here. When Harry is nearly hit by a bludger with a whoosh, the U.S. version says, then again, whoosh. And the U.K. version says, next moment, whoosh. So I, I don't know. I feel like maybe the American version just really needed to drive in the fact that this is the second whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really needed to know that this was another whoosh. They're really against next moment. They are, apparently. But speaking of moments... <laughs> Here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 15. Homegirl is essentially living two days for every one day everyone else is living. Like, I would have cracked after day one and just started using the time turner to take naps. 
A time turner would be so useful to get all this podcast stuff done. Or take naps. But this is why I'm the Hermione of the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and because I'm the Ron. <laughs> I tend to overfill my plate too. Yeah. They haven't won the Quidditch Cup since Charlie Weasley had been Seeger. And Harry desperately wants to win, partially because of how much he just wants to broomstick it to Malfoy. <laughs> If there had been a Dementor around, as the sobbing wood passed Harry the cup, as he lifted it into the air, Harry felt he could have produced the world's best Patronus. All the feels. It's so many feels. So great. Oh my gosh. Chapter 16. Professor Trelawney's Prediction. When Harry and Ron see Hermione's exam schedule, in the U.S. version, Harry wonders if there is any point asking how she's going to sit for two exams at once. The U.K. version, it drops the four and just says, sit two exams at once. I prefer the four, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Sit for two exams. Sit mm -hmm. two. I mean, honestly, either one is fine. My yeah. brain isn't confused. <laughs> Granted, I also realized I read the illustrated versions as they've been coming out. Mm -hmm. I actually like sat down and read them, and those are the British versions. Yeah, we've talked about that before, too. So, I mean, like they still changed Philosopher over to Sorcerer, but the other vocabulary changes were not present. I double-checked. Yeah. So I think I got used to some of them without realizing I got used to some of them. Mm-hmm. But when the trio realizes that the executioner is showing up for Buckbeak's appeal, Ron howls that he's spent ages reading up on stuff for him in the U.S. version. The U.K. version again drops the word and Ron just says he spent ages reading up stuff for him. If we wanted to rephrase that another way, we would say looking up stuff. Yeah. The flobberworm based exam that Hagrid set up for his students is described in the American version as the easiest exam any of them had ever taken. In the UK version, it was the easiest exam they had ever sat. Which, again, seems odd. I mean, I guess you sit to take an exam, typically, so... Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> in the US version, Defense Against the Dark Arts was their second to last exam but in the UK version, it was their second from last exam. So that just depends on which direction you're counting from. Are you going to the end or coming from the end? Yeah. I just like saying penultimate. <laughs> <laughs> the trio run into Fudge after their Defense Against the Dark Arts exam. He greets Harry, and Ron and Hermione hover awkwardly in the background. As they are not on speaking terms with the Minister of Magic in the American version, or the Minister for Magic in the UK version. I feel like I remember it both ways, but for sounds uh, Minister for Magic sounds more British to me. <laughs> I have no idea. And now here are some of our favorite moments from the episode covering Chapter 16. All anyone wanted to do was stroll the grounds and sit in the grass drinking iced pumpkin juice. I never realized that Hogwarts students were such basic witches. <laughs> like, even they enjoy their iced pumpkin drinks and fuzzy scarves. They really are. <laughs> I love the spiral staircase, but I can't imagine climbing all those stairs on a nearly daily basis. Oh, dear God. Like, I'd have to keep a spare set of robes at the top to change into because I would be a sweaty ass mess by the time I got there. Honestly, that's probably the real reason why Trelawney never joins them for meals. <laughs> fuck those stairs. I'll just blame my inner eye. Yeah, fuck those stairs indeed. Chapter 17. Cat, Rat, and Dog. Harry accused Lupin of being Sirius Black's friend, and the American version simplified his response from I haven't been Sirius's friend for 12 years, but I am now, which was the UK version, to simply... I haven't been Sirius's friend, but I am now. I prefer throwing in the 12 years. Yeah. Too many extra words. Right? And here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 17. Could be. <laughs> My little fobble worm was Cody Wody. He could have just been completely worried that opening the door was going to give it a chill. So he tucked I mean, it in first. Maybe. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> That's why we asked. Well, I mean, he is crazy Gary Oldman, after all. It's probably not in his best interest to all of a sudden switch it up and be mild-mannered Gary Oldman. Sane Gary Oldman! <laughs> no, it doesn't work as well without two syllables. Mm -hmm. Stable Gary Oldman! <laughs> 
And still not as good as Crazy Gary Oldman. Never will be. Nope. Like, oh, well, I just wanted to kill Harry, but if I have to go and kill his two sidekicks as well, I mean, that just sounds like an awful lot of energy. I think I'm good, so never mind. Peace, Hogwarts. Crazy Gary Oldman out. Yeah, this just became too much work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Three people. I'm, that's too much for me. That's too many. I'm done. I'm just going to go back to Azkaban. Yeah. Harry starts to ask what's going on, but Lupin lowers his wand, pulls Black to his feet, and embraces him like a brother. <laughs> yeah, brothers that totally want to bang each other. Chapter 18. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. There actually weren't any notable differences in this chapter, so we're just going to move on to our favorite moments from the episode covering Chapter 18. <laughs> At least I have my voice and can talk. Oh yeah? Well, my voice is sexy, so there. You did bring back the sexy voice. <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing, bringing sexy, sexy voice back. back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Yeah! It needs to be one of your squeak yes. Them other muggles don't know how to act. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe put Petrificus Totalis on Scabbers. Like that way he can't go anywhere and you can tell your goddamn story and Ron doesn't have to get the shit bitten out of his fingers. Or, I don't know, magic a cage, guys! You're fucking wizards! Wait, you love to talk about Harry Potter? Can you believe it? What? We're Hold only on. on episode 57. Oh my god, me too. We should totally do something with this. Oh my god, let's start a podcast! Holy shit, that's a great idea! <laughs> <laughs> he was probably spending the majority of the time tuning out the story as he glared at Pettigrew, a.k.a. Scabbers, <laughs> a.k.a. Wormtail... And then just tuned in from time to time to see if Lupin was finished yet. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Wait, Snape? <laughs> like, he was just there in his head like, oh, I'm going to get him. I'm going to, I just, I just need the perfect in. I just need the perfect in. <laughs> nope, that's not it. I just, it's got, oh, there it is. There it is. Reveal. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 19. The Servant of Lord Voldemort. When Harry, Ron, and Hermione attack Snape in the Shrieking Shack, Lupin thanks Harry. The American version has it saying, I'm still not saying I believe you, he told Lupin. Then it's time we offered you some proof, Lupin said. You, boy, give me Peter, please, now. The UK version says, I'm still not saying I believe you, Harry retorted. Then it's time we offered you some proof, said Black. You, boy, give me Peter, now. So this was a person switch, but I'm inclined to think it was an error in the U.S. version because I can't see why Lupin would have called Ron boy. I, I got to agree with you there, yeah, especially because Lupin was Ron's teacher. So for the entire year, like he'd know yeah. his fucking name. Right. You boy. <laughs> you boy. Give me your rat. <laughs> it's very odd. So I, I have to agree with you. That is. But it is also interesting that. It's like they decided they wanted Lupin to say it, so they switched it, but they didn't think to change the boy. But they're like, but we're going to add a please because he wasn't <laughs> born in a barn. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lupin. He's polite. He's polite. Please, he'll, boy, please. He'll, he'll call you boy, but he'll say please. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Very odd. Interesting. Strange. Mm -hmm. Odd. But here's our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 19. They're, they're so cool looking. Legs for days. Legs for days. Look at the gams on that wedge-tailed <laughs> eagle. <laughs> Hermione is shocked and says, you attacked a teacher. You know, this from the girl who literally set fire to the man when she was 11. Mind you. <laughs> she did. She totally did. Hypocrite Hermione, <laughs> you attacked a teacher. And Harry's over there like, fucking A right I attacked a teacher. Like, let's be honest, I've been wanting to do that shit for three years. <laughs> he did. He totally did. <laughs> right? <laughs> we thought he was our friend. No, he's dead. So we didn't think he was our friend? <laughs> Obviously not. Dead people can't be friends. Ever. 
And it is silly, since the rat runs across a piano and plays a few notes as Larry and Mo attempt to hit him with a spell. <laughs> the only thing that would have made it sillier is if Scabbers had played chopsticks while jumping across <laughs> the piano keys. Also, why is there a piano? I have no idea. It just seems so random. It is very random. But, I mean, how else are you going to get a rat to play a few notes? It's true. I mean, come on. Is there maybe a comedic rule that says, like, piano equals slapstick? Yeah, but it's usually dropping on someone's head. That is very true. It would have been great if, like, one of them would have gone over the piano and been like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Like, just The entertainer. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Exactly. Yeah-da-da-da-da-da-da. That's the one. Slapstick. I just got a mental image of, like, the Azkaban break room and, like... <laughs> like regular wizards like walking past Dementors hey Bernie how you doing today <laughs> the Dementor just goes <sighs> yeah <laughs> well, sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays <laughs> I'm sorry this day just really sucks <laughs> chapter 20 the Dementors kiss after Sirius invites Harry to live with him, he seems to think that Harry wouldn't want to leave the Dursleys. And in the American version, Harry responds saying, Are you insane? Of course I want to leave the Dursleys. In the UK version, he says, Are you mad? I love mad. Right? I do to too. To mean crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you ask somebody if they're mad here in America, they're going to be like, no. Yeah, but context is everything. But yeah, I, I agree. Like... It's not necessarily something we would say to someone here. It would be, it would definitely be more, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Yeah. Are it's, you off your rocker? I would, <laughs> <laughs> and here are some of our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 20. Never mind the fact that every other time anything goes near it, it goes full on murder tree. It goes on a murdering tree. Like a murdering spree. Uh-huh. The book had Crookshanks exit first and hit the knot to freeze the tree so that it would be safe for everyone else to exit. And I prefer that because it was really inconsistent that the movie took this tree that they had clearly established as a tree whose bite is actually worse than its bark by having it rip anything that comes near it limb from limb. Then it decides it's going to branch out in a completely different direction and turn it into a normal tree. The root of the problem here is the inconsistency. There's no explanation as to why the tree all of a sudden leaves them alone. It would be nice if they had given us an explanation because truly, I'm stumped. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you done? No, I am not. It's a real mystery. Oh my god. Can we please just keep rolling? <laughs> Fine. Ugh, Only since I can Jesus. tell you're pining for me to stop. <laughs> you are so lucky we're not recording in person today. Oh my gosh. I always took it as him being serious. Well, no, he wasn't serious, serious, he's Ron. Ron but... <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't even give him a reaction aside from a surprised look when they were outside and Wormtail was trying to remind him of the good old days as though he wasn't really a dude in a super convincing rat costume the whole damn time. <laughs> you know goddamn well if he were in dog form, his tail would be wagging like crazy. Because he's such a good boy. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? <laughs> Sirius is. Bad but's a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> Emerges from the Whomping Willow and somehow doesn't notice the werewolf at all. Well, of course not. Snape is totally in tunnel vision mode. Harry attacked him. He must retaliate. <laughs> Sorry. Tunnel vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought the joke was. Nope, that one was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I pun so much, I can't even help it. <laughs> Chapter 21, Hermione's Secret. Again, no real differences in this chapter either, unless you want to count another instance of a you in the word behavior, when the US version is like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> oh, I, I saw that. There's something, I still prefer the you. I don't know why. It's pre it might be pretentious of me, but... It's totally pretentious of you. It is. It's you color with a U, too. <laughs> I can't... Every time I see it with a U, I read it as color. <laughs> I do, too, but I still prefer it. <laughs> color. But here's our favorite moments from the episodes covering Chapter 21. 
it's just hard to take it from him because he's such a dick. Giggity? Oh my god, what are you, 12? Sorry, I just couldn't let that slide. <laughs> Giggity. Oh my god, what are you, 12? Okay, so we're both 12. But together we're 24. I'm not sure that's how that works. Because together we're actually 74, and I immediately regret saying that. Yeah, why would you do that? That's bad maths, that is. Let's just keep rolling, please. Okay. Please, okay. Keep rolling. Yeah. Not a lick of that happened in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no fudge, no Snape, no Madam Pomfrey, no Caps Lock Harry, no chocolate choking. Sounds boring. Entirely. Side note, I, I am entirely Ron when he's trying to explain who Scabbers is. Yes, you really are. Mm -hmm. God, we are Ron and Hermione trying to do a podcast, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Data Drax. I mean, that seems like it would be the first fucking thing that you would say. Not, oh, my pet rat did it. No, my pet rat is a fucking dude. That's what you lead off with. He's a man. A man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, time travel, time travel, time travel. And then it's basically this. Okay, we're back in time. Where do we go? Wait, what? Look, it's light out like it was earlier because we went back in time. Wait, what? Hey, look, there we are like we were earlier when I laid the smack down on Malfoy because time travel. LOL, what? Dude, Harry, we do not have time for you to be a dumbass. And that pretty much sums up the book and the movie for this part. Yeah. What she was going to use the time turner to do, she already did. Yeah. I like to say nothing never didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a triple negative, but it makes sense. It does, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't think about it too hard. <laughs> you gotta try and you, be like me, as little thinking as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but that's a completely different episode. That's a horsey bird of another color. A horsey bird of another <laughs> color. <laughs> I think I just got the episode title. <laughs> uh, good times. We need to remember that phrase. Well, That's a horsey it's, it's, bird of another color. It's been recorded, so it has. There we go. <laughs> that doesn't guarantee anything. Yeah, true. But really, Harry, maybe you want to remember that immobilis spell for the next time you piss off that tree with your existence. Seems like a good way to avoid being tree capitated. Don't. Uh, bop, bop. Don't start that again. Fine, I'll just keep rolling. Was he just living as a stag all that time in the Forbidden Forest? Right, like, like, what was he doing? Think that one through. I do believe we call those deadbeat dads. Nope, just the dead dad. <laughs> Fuck, that was terrible. You set it up. I had I to hit know, it. I I loved it. I just batten it into the shit out of go, it. Oh, you go fuck yourself <laughs> right now. Chapter 22. Owl Post Again. In Sirius's letter to Harry, he says that he sent him the firebolt. In the U.S. version, he wrote, Crookshanks took the order to the Owl office for me. I used your name, but told them to take the gold from my own Gringotts vault. In the U.K. version, he wrote, Crookshanks took the order to the Owl office for me. I used your name, but told them to take the gold from Gringotts vault number 711. My own. So it just specified his vault number. Which always makes me wonder how he was able to access his funds. Right? I thought that too. Would a letter from him, like, in his handwriting, saying access the vault, like, is that sufficient enough? Because I don't know that the goblins would care. Right. I feel like the goblins aren't going to give a shit. Like, I don't feel like the goblins get involved in that. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to be like, we don't, yeah, we don't care about wizard politics. We're not going to, like, freeze his account or anything. We're going to make this a random bonus Potter pondering. Yeah. What are your thoughts on how Sirius Black was able to access his funds? We'll get there. We'll see what everyone else thinks, too. Yep. Agreed. But included in this letter from Sirius was also a written permission slip for Harry to attend Hogsmeade on the weekends. Mm. In the American version, it made him feel as warm and contented as though he'd swallowed a bottle of hot butter beer in one gulp. In the UK version, as though he swallowed a bottle of hot butter beer in one go. Both make sense to me. I mean... They totally both make sense. Although, one gulp makes me imagine the way my husband drinks beer. <laughs> and one go just makes me imagine... Chugging? The nonstop chugging. Yeah. I can see that. And Len can literally just swallow a 12 ounce. Like, he just pours it down his throat and I don't understand it. I know. I, I've seen him do it and it's... I mean... I don't want to call your husband creepy, but it's... It's a little creepy. 
It's a little creepy, but you know what? It's more impressive than it is creepy, so I'll give him that. It definitely balances out. Yeah. It's a very good party trick, I have it to say. It is 100% a very good party trick. <laughs> also, the letter gave him permission to visit Hogsmeade on weekends in the American version and at weekends in the UK version, which gets another blue squiggly line from Google Docs. So there's that. <laughs> Oh, if you think of it at the week's end. Yeah. At week's end. At week's end. Weekends. I got nothing. I legitimately but it still gets got a squiggly there. line from Google Docs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and lastly, when Harry is freaking the shit out of Uncle Bag of Assholes about having a convicted murderer for a dog father, he mentions that he likes to keep in touch. In the American version, it says, check if I'm happy. And the UK version just says, check, I'm happy. I mean, both of them work for me. Yeah. What ifs? Change it, don't change it. <laughs> yeah. And finally, here are some of our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter 22. I mean, who wants their incompetencies on display like that? Not I. <laughs> Not I. <laughs> Nor I. Nor I. Nor <laughs> I. And Dumbledore says that it's an easy mistake to make since he does look extraordinarily like James. Except for the eyes. He has his mother's eyes. He should really give those back. <laughs> Neville runs up to Harry asking him where he got it. And he is closely followed by Seamus who wants to know, Can I have a go, Harry? After you, of course. Because, you know, Seamus likes sloppy seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Oh, I'm sad that we're done with... Azkaban. I can't believe it. This is the end of Prisoner of Azkaban. I know. This is insane. Like, officially. This is insane. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm extremely sad about it. Partially because I just don't want to deal with Goblet of Fire. <laughs> oh, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun talking about it. I know, but I just, I, I fear I'm not going to be as nice as I have been in the past. Which is your prerogative. I'll it's, rein you in. I guess. <laughs> Thank God you're the one who edits this stuff. <laughs> and writes it. <laughs> well, that too, yes. That definitely helps. You control the mute button. <laughs> Your snark is super helpful, but I can still edit that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that brings us to our final Potter ponderings of Prisoner of Azkaban. And those are, what were some of your favorite parts about the episodes covering Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban? You can also just include your favorite parts of the book and film in general, really. But, yeah. I mean, come on, we want to hear what you liked about us. Right? Help <laughs> us help us do more things you like. Right? We like feedback. Yes. And that being said, we also, I'm not going to say we like it, but we also can handle constructive criticism yes if you think there is something that we could do to improve let us know in a non-public forum yes <laughs> if you don't like us, us tell us privately <laughs> if you like us shout it for the whole fucking world to exactly see, basically <laughs> and then as we mentioned too we want your thoughts on how Sirius black was able to access his funds yeah in his vault when he was a convict Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them. Mm -hmm. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Andrew Smith. He writes, Hi, ladies. My name is Andrew Smith. I live near Melbourne in Australia. I'm a Hufflepuff with some Ravenclaw tendencies. My Ilvermorny house is Horned Serpent, which I think matches up with Ravenclaw, so that checks out. My Patronus is a Chow Dog. My first try, I got a rat. I was not happy. Second try, I got a Russian blue cat. As cool as they seem, I'm not a cat person. <laughs> My wand is spruce wood, unicorn hair core, nine and three quarters inches. How magical is that? And slightly yielding flexibility. My story of getting into Potter is boring compared to a lot of people. I didn't resist it and then get convinced to read slash watch it. It didn't mark a turning point in my life. It didn't save my life, though I do have depression, and it has helped me to unwind and escape reality. I had never heard of Harry Potter until my aunt who lived in Hong Kong sent me the first two books for my birthday in 1999. I devoured them, and when they came over to visit that Christmas, she gave me the third book. 
From the first time I looked at the Philosopher's Stone cover, I was in love. Unfortunately, I never went to a midnight release of any of the books or movies, as there was nowhere near me doing them. Thank you for your fun podcast. I look forward to cringing while I hear my words read aloud. <laughs> well, I don't think you should cringe, Andrew, because no. I still think that's a fantastic story, even if you don't have what you would consider to be as exciting as other people's stories. I love it. I yeah. think it's great. That's an awesome story. And we are not biased at all. No. Even though you are one of our Order of Merlin first class patrons, <laughs> which I just realized we never actually thanked you for joining us. I was kind of holding off a little bit because I knew you weren't caught up. But now that I know you're caught up, we really do want to give a sincere shout out and thank you to Andrew Smith, who is yes. our latest Order of Merlin. Technically, he's not our latest. He is our second to most recent Order of Merlin first class patron because he just yes. joined us a few weeks ago. But Carly just upgraded. Oh, so our support Carly. badger has just upgraded her to being first class, which she already well, was, but now it's official. I mean, yeah, she was always a first class, but. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Andrew. It's so fun to get to know you a little bit better, I gotta say. That's one of my favorite things about all this is getting to know listeners better through these right? sorting hat stories. I love it. And now that you're all caught up, too, you can start participating more in our chats and stuff. Right? And listen on Discord when we when we record mm -hmm. and good times. <laughs> Join in next time we play a Harry Potter game as a group virtually. Yes. Oh my god, that was so much I was fun. I still have to share day. the picture from that. It was so much fun. We had a good time. <laughs> but if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, patronus how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can just message it to us over social media. This will bring us to our trivia question, which is, what was the name of the village pub in Little Hangleton? The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word, hashtag the Bryce is right, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at JustKeepRolling.com to check out our Just Keep Rolling and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on Patreon.com slash JustKeepRolling. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like Just Keep Rolling swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channels, virtual hangouts to play those games and stuff, mm -hmm. and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we start Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire with Chapter 1, The Riddle House, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. Thank you.